several have asked me in the last few days and weeks how how my wife is doing, how she, we're doing. And I, I, I thought about it and I kind of described it in my mind as a, if you're a baseball fan, uh, baseball is 162 games. It covers about a four month or more time period. And um, somewhere around July, end of July, they call it the dog days. It's when um, you've been playing for a while, you're trying to push through into the finish line, and um, um, the dog days are tough. It's in the middle of summer and it's hard. And um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, Pastor Cindy, God has kept his hand on her. Uh, Brianna, your song was perfect today. We're not alone. Amen. You have been faithful in praying for us, in praying for Cindy, and sending texts and cards and calls and um, bringing meals, um, just doing the extra little things, and uh, it means a lot. Several nights ago, it was probably about midnight, and it was a tough day for Cindy tough night and um, we went to bed and you know we did all the normal things that we do and um, said good night and prayed for her and um, started resting and kind of settling in for her to sleep and all of a sudden I heard her just kind of sobbing a little bit and I wanted to just hold her and take it away and I did that, but it was, it was God. It was the Holy Spirit who comforted her and tells us that we're not alone. Amen. Did you know that you could be in the middle of a room full of people and still feel totally alone? You can be in the company of the person that you love the most and still feel totally alone. But when you're in Christ, you're never alone. Amen? Amen? And when nobody else can comfort you and when nothing else can comfort you, he does. And I praise him for that. So I just want to publicly, and I speak for both of us, just thank you. Thank you for your love and thank you for your compassion and your prayers. Um, I get frustrated because I'm the one that's supposed to be ministering, but we've been getting ministered to. And that's an amazing, amazing thing. So God bless you. We love you. And um, if you if you need to know anything else, and, and I've had people say, Pastor, I, I wanted to I wanted to text Cindy or call her, but I didn't want to disturb her. I guarantee you, uh, she appreciates it. If you text her or you call her or you uh, whatever, she she appreciates that, and you can go ahead and do that. Please do that because it means a lot. Amen. 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 Thank you. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're in a series that we began last week called Staying in Your Lane. What does it mean to stay in your lane? Uh, we were coming home from Vallejo on Friday night, and uh, we were in the fast lane because I was going fast. No. I mean, I was going the speed limit. Well, probably about five over, you know, because they always tell you. So, anyway. As I was, as we were driving, all of a sudden, from behind us, we could hear a sound, and a white something just shot by us. I mean, it must have, we figured it was probably going about 90. I mean, it was, it shot past us, and it was going and weaving in and out of traffic, and Cindy looked at me, and she said, where is the police when the guy that's driving 90 and shifting lanes is around where where's the police and so we're going along pretty soon we look over and there's a police car and and, and the first thing out of her mouth was yes <laughs> we got pulled over and then we looked closer and it was just the road crew uh, and the policeman was just sitting there with his lights flashing and we were dismayed I guess a little bit but, but 
you know, you 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 understand that when you're in a traffic uh, period like that and cars are going fast and how many know there can be tragedy that strikes? There can be a problem. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it's much the same way when we're talking about who and what we are. And that is, by the way, the title of the message this morning. The, the series is called Staying in Your Lane. The title of the message today is Who and What We Are. How many know you can't stay in a lane unless you know who you are and what you are? Amen. You won't understand. You won't comprehend. You won't uh, be able to explain it. But when you know who you are, and you know what you are, then you know what uh, God expects of you. Probably if I had a subtitle, and I do, it's a very basic thing. Two things. Number one, write this down. Number one, we're His. We are His. He owns us. God owns us. If you gave your heart to the Lord, if you asked Him to be Lord, trust me, He answered and He came into your life. Now you're bought and paid for. Amen? Amen. And the amazing thing is, is if you are a Christian and you start to drift out of your lane, how many know you become miserable? Mm -hmm. The most miserable people in the world are Christians who are backslidden. I mean, I don't know anybody else. If you know people out in the world and they've never asked the Lord to be their Savior, they're out there, they're having a good time. They're doing whatever they do. Oh, yes, they may have trouble and they may have uh, things that happen and so on and so forth. But by and large, they, they just kind of are oblivious a little bit and they're just living their life. But if you're a Christian, if you know the Lord, and you purposely decide not to do what he's called you to do. How many know you're miserable? And I've got news for you. You're miserable to be, to be around. <laughs> Amen. There's nothing more ironic than a grumpy Christian. A grouchy Christian. Amen. So Paul addresses that here. The second thing that we understand is that not only are we His, but we are supposed to grow. How many want to grow in the Lord? Amen. How many hopefully are growing in the Lord right now? Isn't that important? Isn't that wonderful? If you're growing in the Lord, how many know you're a happy Christian? Yeah. You're somebody who knows who they are, you know what God expects, and you're beginning to see how God works in your life. And when he tells you to go this way, you go that way. And when he tells you to go this way, you go this way. And that's how we have peace in our life. So Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. And he gives them some instruction here. I want to read it to you and read it with me. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Father, we just ask that you anoint your word. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many know that new birth is important? How many have had children or grandchildren recently? Aren't the babies amazing? I mean, really, aren't they incredible? They're, they're, they, they, they're, they're growing. They're, they're alive. Thank God they're alive. How many know that babies are alive? Did you also know that if you are a Christian, you are alive? Amen. Paul is not talking here to dead Christians. He's talking to live Christians. Mm -hmm. He says, I would like to feed you with something other than milk, but I can't. Because up to this point, all you can handle is pablo, is milk. And even now, you still can't handle the truth. You still can't take the meat of the word because there's some things going on in your life. You're still babies. 
He said, where there is strife and envy and divisions, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? First of all, I want to tell you something. God wants more for us than who we are. He wants more for us than who the world sees us. How many know we're not mere men? We're his. Yeah. I said, we're his. You say, well, pastor, I'm still human. Yes, you are. But there is something powerful inside of you. The Holy Spirit is in residence in you. If you've asked Christ into your life, if you've asked him to become your Savior, church, listen to me, you're different. Yeah. In fact, I know most of you and you're different. <laughs> The awesome thing is, God sees us different than the world does. The world may see you one way, but God sees you another. The world may think you're worthless. God thinks you're worth everything. Amen. The world may see you as dull and plain. God sees you as alive and amazing. That's how he views us. Amen. He loves us. He cherishes us. Everything we are, everything we have. He has given us. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the world or how the world sees you. What matters is how he sees you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Did you know, church, it doesn't even matter how you see yourself. I've learned that a long time ago. See, we have a self view. We have an opinion of ourselves that oftentimes doesn't match reality. Because of how we've been brought up, because of things that have occurred in our life, because of, of ways that people have talked to us over the years, we have this opinion of ourselves. And the awesome thing about God is He looks beyond that. Amen. He says, I don't see a loser. I don't see somebody who is worthless. I don't see somebody who has a problem. I see somebody who has the answer. Amen. And I'm the answer. Amen. I see somebody who can change the world. If you'll let me change you. How many know when he changes us, then we can change the world? Yeah. So we're talking about this church, this Corinthian church. It was, as is described, has been described by, to me many times. It was an inch deep and a mile wide. It was a spiritual church. It was a big church. It was a church that considered itself awesome. The problem was there was carnality, there was immaturity in there, and because of that, uh, there, were, there were issues that were going on that became outright sin, and it began to infect and affect the whole church. And so Paul has to write this letter, and he tells them, look, you're born again, but you're still babies, and you're not allowing my spirit to help you grow up. Church, listen. Who and what we are is determined by how much we give to Him. We were talking about God's plan. God's plan is birth, growth, and maturity. Birth, growth, maturity. We recognize this in the physical realm immediately. How many, how many think the babies... Um, hold, uh, Brian, hold Olivia up a little bit. Let everybody see this beautiful baby. It just happens to be my granddaughter. Aww. Aww. That's what I say every time I see her. Aww. Aww. Okay. Now, now understand this is a baby and she's beautiful. She's got blue eyes and blonde hair. She's gorgeous. And she's usually pretty happy. In fact, she's most of the time happy. Which is amazing because not all my kids are that way. But anyway. But okay, Ryan, you sit down. <laughs> so that's the baby. Now, how many think she's precious right now? But if in five years from now, Brian were to stand up and hold her up and she's exactly the same size, how many would go from, oh, she's cute, to, oh my goodness, what happened? What's wrong? She's not growing. I mean, she's still a baby five years from now. She still looks exactly the same. How many know all of a sudden it's doctors, it's scientists, it's we're trying to figure out what's wrong with Olivia. Church, I use that as an illustration because 
the same exact things oftentimes happen to us as Christians. We get saved. Have to raise your hand if you got saved one day. So one day you got saved. How awesome was that? It was your spiritual birthday. Amen. And everybody rejoiced. The fact the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoiced. So why is it then 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road and maybe we haven't advanced, we haven't grown, we haven't, Jimmy, we haven't matured. What happens then? Well, if it was in the natural, how many know we'd all be alarmed? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen oftentimes in the church. And that's exactly what Paul was saying. Pastor Jared, that's exactly what he was saying. He's saying, look, you guys got to a point, and that's great, but you didn't progress any farther. In fact, he said, I, I, I need to start feeding you a solid food, Eddie, so you can grow. But the problem is you can't receive it yet because you're still carnal. You're still a babe in Christ. You haven't grown, haven't matured. And all of a sudden, nobody is upset except Paul. Nobody in the church is, is upset. The Corinthian church was, they felt like they were fine. They felt like they were okay. Mike, they felt like they were fine. Paul said, the problem is, you don't see because you're blind. Mm -hmm. And you're blind because you're still babes. And he said, it's time for you to grow up. And I'm telling you today, I believe it's time for the church, for us to grow up. I can't stay in the direction and the lane that God has me in. How many know unless I know what my purpose is? Amen. Unless I know who I am Amen. and what I am. I'm a born again, spirit-filled Christian that needs to grow and mature. Mm -hmm. I need to go from here to here to here. As the Bible says, I need to be changed from glory to glory. But the problem is, church, is that we often our growth is stunted and we don't know why. I believe it's because we haven't let God do what he wants to do in our life. So here's the message. I want to just share three things with you. Number one, the spiritual infant is concerned with self rather than service. The spiritual infant is concerned with self rather than service. The time of great rejoicing at birth, that salvation is often awesome. It's great. But the problem is, as time has gone on, there's been no change. There's been no growth. In heaven and here, we're snatched from, from the enemy. How many think that's wonderful? But the problem is, we need to grow. It's the same in the natural. It's the same in the spirit. Babies are have certain characteristics. They, they get accustomed to attention. Pampering the baby. And the results are you get to walk the floor night after night. How many know you can't wait till the baby can eat full food so they can sleep all night? Mom, somebody say amen. amen. You can't wait till the baby eats enough to where they get some teeth so they can eat some food so they can stay asleep for at least eight hours, hopefully anyway. I've talked to parents who go, my kid can't, can't go to sleep. When they do, they sleep for a few hours and then they wake up again. My boys slept. When my boys were little, they slept. I mean, mom would feed them probably sooner than what somebody said. She'd feed them some rice cereal at night before they go to bed and man, they'd sleep all night. Until one time, my oldest, Jeff, um, start waking up. My, my wife and I made a deal with each other. The deal was this. I will take care of him the first year. When he wakes up, I'll get up so you can sleep and go to work. But after a year, it's your turn. And I, I made that agreement right away because I thought, well, that's a great deal. Because after a year, he'll be sleeping all night, so, you know, I won't have to get up. <laughs> Little did I know that I created a little monster. And here's how I did it. Jeff, after about a year, one, one night, he woke up probably 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and he's crying. 
And so, of course, I rolled over and tapped Cindy. And she rolled back over and tapped me and said, oh, no, no. Remember the deal? Uh, so I got up and I went and made a little bottle. And I gave him the bottle and he fell asleep and I thought, end of story. And then a couple hours later, he woke up again. So I went and filled a little more in the bottle and a pattern began to develop. Every night, he would wake up. There was a point, folks, at which I had a, there was a little uh, stand outside his bedroom. He was about a year and a half old and I had bottles lined up. <laughs> I thought I was a genius. I put just a little bit of, a little bit of apple juice in each bottle. And I've got about four of them lined up, and I'll just... And finally, my wife said, Are you tired of waking up every night and feeding him four different little bottles? Are, are you tired yet? Are you, are you done with this? And, and I'm looking at her like, well, what else can I do? She goes, let him cry. <laughs> I said, I can't do that. She said, oh, well... Okay, then you keep doing the bottles, you keep doing that, that's fine. That's what you want to do. And so, I made the leap. I let him cry. Anyway, long story short, I didn't have to get up anymore. <laughs> but I felt like an idiot for months. Because <laughs> that's how long it took me to figure it out. See, babies get accustomed to attention. An infant is upset at the smallest thing. I mean, you can, uh, a baby, you just jostle them wrong or you just look at them wrong and, and they'll start crying. You know, because that's just how babies are. Uh, some other things about babies, uh, um, uh, like I said, they get accustomed to attention and, and they need that constant focus. Did you know that Christians oftentimes are the same way, especially baby Christians? I mean, all the attention is there. They, they, they wear their feelings on their sleeves. They're like bombs sometimes. They're ready to explode. At church, they're extra nice, but at home, they're explosive. At church, she's ideal, but at home, she's impossible. At church, he's always praising, but at home, he's always pouting. At church, he's Mr. Good. At home, he's Mr. Grouch. At church, she's an example, but at home, exasperating. The infant is a receiver, not a giver. And so we learn as Christians that we have to change who we are, not in church. Folks, we have to change who we are at home. Amen? Yeah. If you are nice and kind to people at church, and you go home and you're mean to your kids and to your spouse. How many know you haven't grown? And you're still immature. If, if I can be wonderful with other people but mean to my wife, how many know I haven't even begun to grow up? And the problem is we focus more on the outward than we do on the inward. We don't look at the fact that God is watching me when nobody else is around. Yeah. And that's the indicator of where I'm at with the Lord. Oh, we can be tempted. We can give in at times. I, I get that. I've been grouchy. I know it seems hard to believe, but... <laughs> I've been impatient. I've been self-absorbed and selfish. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that. Of course you have. <laughs> and here's the deal. Is it an ongoing thing? Is it the basis of who you are? Or does God speak to you on a daily basis and work on you? Amen. And, and speak. The, the Bible tells us Jesus he speaks to us and we know his voice. Amen. Amen. We were driving uh, around the other day and we made a wrong turn over here in Antioch and we went down a, what some would say a wrong street. 
it was rough. You know how you're in a, you know you're in a rough neighborhood, all the windows have bars on. <laughs> and it's Saturday morning, and people are out, people dressed, I can't even describe it to you. I'm going, I wouldn't even walk out of my bedroom looking like that, let alone out of the house. And they're standing on the side of the street, and there's a bunch of them, and they're all talking. And so, Cindy's got like a little, you know, I'm like, oh, just drive, go straight, go straight. Don't slow down. And all of a sudden, and I started kind of feeling that, and all of a sudden, all these spirits spoke to my heart. And he said, see that guy that's standing there literally in his underwear? <laughs> literally. So I died for that guy. I love that guy. See that gal over there? With, looks like she hasn't had a bath in a week. I died for her. All of a sudden, I'm looking at this whole street with a different lens. I'm looking in a different way. It's not about me anymore. It's about them. It's not about what I think or feel or sense, but it's what God would love to do in their life. Amen. And all of a sudden, I have a different feeling. I have a different viewpoint. I have a different sense. Church, do you understand that, that when we are spiritually infants, we, we, um, we receive, we fuss and fight over our rights. And God has said, it's not about you. It's not about your rights. It's about what I want to do in you. Yeah. And I want to change you. Doug, I want to transform you. I want to make you into something different. I want you to go farther tomorrow than you were today. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. And so I allow God to work in my life. I learn to grow up, to mature. The second thing is a spiritual infant is concerned with argument rather than action. Envy and strife and divisions are his occupation. Perhaps the most underestimated sin in the Bible is strife. Listen to Galatians 5.19. I want to read this to you. I'm reading it slowly because I want you to hear it. Paul said, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Pastor, I don't do any of that. I must be a pretty mature Christian. Hatred. I don't hate anybody. Contention. Jealousy. Outbursts of wrath. Envy. Murder. Drunkenness. Reveries. Do you know what reveries is? That's party hardy, baby. Party hardy, yeah. TGIF all the way through the weekend. <laughs> Reveries means you are totally open to anything and everything. You will drink all night, all day, and have a party all weekend long. Now listen. You say, well, pastor, I don't do most of those. When I don't, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things, listen, will not inherit the kingdom of God. How many want to inherit the kingdom of God? I said, how many want to inherit the kingdom of God? <laughs> Church, it's not about do's and don'ts. It's about heart and lifestyle. Amen. It's about who you are inside and about what God is doing. You can't stay a baby forever. Amen. Or else while you're in the bathtub, they're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because <laughs> you know people do that. We have to understand that God is calling the church in the U.S. today to grow up. Yeah. Folks, listen, we're facing things that are um, spiritually unprecedented. We're looking at, at a nation right now over everything else. 
we will get upset because some baby seals up in Alaska were killed. But about 2,600 babies are killed every single day. And we don't say a word as a nation. In fact, we say, no, 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 that's okay, that's a good thing. Because you have a right, ladies, to choose. I would say that we have a right to choose life. We have a right to choose death. And you have the right to choose your own life or your own death. But you don't have the right to choose somebody else's. I'm sorry. Church, do you understand that we are living in a nation right now that needs the church to be the church? Amen. Not religious, but relational. Doesn't mean that, that our set of rules is better than your set of rules. It means that when I have a relationship with God who created the universe, I can reach out to a lost generation and bring them in. Amen. Amen. But the onus is on us. God said, I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm going to give you everything you need. But it's up to you to do something. God is not going to grow you. You must do that. Amen? Amen? He'll give you all the provision for you to mature, but he expects you to do it. Right. And finally, a spiritual infant looks at people rather than the master. Paul was <coughs> upset because they were looking at him. He had his followers. Paul had his followers. And they said, well, I'm with Paul. Paul's my guy. And he's, he's the guy. Somebody else said, no, 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 no. Apollos, Paul just planted the church. Apollos is the one that pastored it. So we're Apollos' disciples. And then there was others who said, no, forget those two. We're Peter's disciples. We, we're, we're of Cephas, which is Peter. <coughs> Because Peter's the head of the church, so that's who we follow. And finally, Paul's trying to get them. He says, you guys don't get it. I'm nothing. Apollos is nothing. Peter is nothing. Jesus is everything. Amen. I planted this church. Paul watered it. Mm -hmm. God's the one who gave the increase. Right. He's the one that grows it. He's the one that you need to focus on. Amen? Amen. People say, well, you know, we, Pastor, we just love Harvest Time Church. Harvest Time Church. Can I just tell you I appreciate you and love you? But there's a lot of wonderful churches out there. And there's a lot of wonderful pastors. And I know many of them. And I'm friends with many of them. It's not about Harvest Time Church. It's about the church. Amen. Amen? Amen. You guys aren't members of Harvest Time Church. You are members of the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. And it's time the church understands that and we, we work together. Amen. Amen. We love each other. We work together. We grow and we mature. And we prefer one another. And church, when we begin to do that, then God can grow us. Amen. We begin to mature. We begin to see that it's not about me. It's about Him. What does a spiritual infant need? They need three things. Number one, they need to look to Christ. You need to look to Christ, if that's you. Amen? Don't look at Pastor Cindy. Don't look at Pastor Dennis. Don't look at Pastor Tammy. Or don't look at anybody. Look to Jesus. Because we're human. We'll let you down. I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to, but I will. And not even mean to. Angie, I, I love you and Joey, you know that. But don't look at me. Look at him. Amen? He's your source. He's the one that's going to work in your life to grow you guys. I, I just get to be a part of it. I get to be Papa. Their kids call me Papa. I, I just get to be that. Amen? And love them. Did you know, church, that your ability to love people 
will, will take you farther than anything in your life. Amen? Amen? Just to love people. Just to be there for them. You, you say, well, Pastor, you're, you're, you're a minister and you've got all this, all this school and this and that. None of that means anything if we don't love people. Amen. Amen. You can know all about the Bible and never really be effective. We need to begin building. How do I build? You build by studying the Word. Yeah. By letting it get in your heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. By praying and seeking Him. When we got the news that Cindy was sick, and she had something inside of her that we didn't want in there. The first thing we did was pray. The very first thing we did was pray. And the very first thing that God did was give us assurance that he was there and he was with us. Amen. Most important thing. More important than the doctors, more important than the medicine, more important than any of that. It's that God's in charge of this. Amen. And we need to defer to him completely. Amen. And the third thing, we need to remember that there's a judgment seat coming. Amen. Christian, look at me. There is a judgment seat coming. You say, well, pastor, I, I, we're not going to be judged. I mean, we're saved. No, listen to me. You're not going to be judged as far as whether you're saved or not. There's a judgment. We call it the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account to Christ for what we did or didn't do while we were saved. Amen. While we were in the body. Amen. Amen. That means I've got a lot to answer for. Matter of fact, I've got a lot to answer for. Did you know that a pastor is responsible for every single person that comes into their church? And will give an account for anybody who has come and stayed. I, I give an account, one day I'll stand and give an account for Richard. I will give an account for Eddie and Vanessa, who've been part of our church, and they are doing an amazing job and loving your kids. That's awesome. But I'm gonna give an account for their life and their growth. To whom much is given, the Bible says much is required. That's what I get to look forward to. You and I have different things we get to look forward to. But we're all going to stand before Jesus. And he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful, enter into the joy of the Lord. Or, you had this opportunity, son, and you didn't do it. You had this opportunity, and you didn't do it. Oh, you're saved. You're in heaven forever. Praise God. But you know those crowns that we talked about and you know those rewards and all that? If your joy and my joy is Christ, then we need to grow up. Amen. And we need to reach people. Amen. And we need to start with the people that we're sitting next to right here. Amen. Husbands, listen to me. You need to start with your home and loving your wife. Wives, listen to me. You need to start with your husband and make sure that you're taking care of him and loving him before you can ever go out and minister to anybody else. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we believe and trust in your word. But Father, we also know, God, that to whom much is given, much is required. And Lord, you expect more of us than sometimes we even expect of ourselves. But Lord, I'm asking right now, God, that you would open our hearts. Father, touch us. Lord, help us ask the hard questions. Are we doing all that we can do for you? Father, are we living a life that is a ministry to not only you, but to those around us? 
Are we loving people through you? Or Father, are we just simply allowing everybody else to minister to us? Father, we ask the Lord today that you open our hearts and our minds. I'd like everybody to stand. When Darwin Benjamin was here several weeks ago, he preached a message to you, those who were here. He said, I want to make a mandate. He said, we're praying for Pastor Cindy. We're believing God to heal her. So we're going to start at the altar, which you did. But we want to end up at the altar. And I want to do something right now. I'd like you all to come and just fill this altar. Come on. We started at the altar. Let's end at the altar. Come on. Come on, guys. right here would say, Pastor, I want to grow. I want to mature. I want, I want to be a grown-up in Christ. Amen. So here's the place that we meet. Here's where we say, Lord, I'm going to sacrifice what I need to. So I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you for salvation. Thank you for coming into my life. Making me what you want me to be. Offering me eternal salvation. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that you put inside of me when I call upon your name. So Lord, I'm asking right now for your forgiveness for walking in the flesh when I need to be walking in the Spirit. So Lord, I sacrifice the flesh right now. Father, help me to grow, to mature, to become the man, woman that you called me to be. So Lord, I'm asking right now for your Holy Spirit to fill my life up. Make me what you want me to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. See, if I mean that, if that's not just a prayer, if it's not just a word or a phrase, it's what God's called me to do. It's what He's called me to be. Amen. That I'll change me from the inside out. And the only way that people are going to know you're different is if your walk shows them. Amen? Amen. Our children, our teenagers are watching us. Amen? They, they can see it. If I'm one way at church and I'm one way at home, how many know I'm a double minded man and I'm unstable in all my ways? If I'm nice and smiling here and I'm mean and nasty at home, how many know I'm a hypocrite? At the very least, I'm just a baby in Christ. But I want to be more than that. How many want to, want to walk worthy? How many want to be more than that? Yes. Father, I pray a blessing over every family here. Father, bless them, touch them. God, walk before them. Lord, if they're struggling physically, Lord, would you heal them? Lord, if they're struggling financially, Father, would you direct them? God, if they're struggling relationally, Lord, would you minister to each one individually so that they can minister to each other? Father, I pray for homes. 
pray for marriages, Lord, to be made whole and healthy, and homes, God, to breathe life into it. God, we love you and we praise you. Father, we want to stay in the lane. We want to stay in the path that you've called us to. And God, we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Turn to somebody and just tell them.